Welcome back, guys, to the JPS podcast. And very, very cool episode today with Dr. Mike Isratel on uh, some of the principles of high pressure training. But more specifically, we spent the better part of an hour talking about uh, the stimulus to fatigue ratio, a very important concept that Mike will be discussing at this year's Ultimate Evidence-Based Conference here in Melbourne, uh, June 28th to 30th. Tickets are available, guys. Link in the description box below if you want to attend and join uh, us at JPS along with uh, some of the industry's finest uh, for a weekend of education, networking, and good times. So Mike will be talking all about, uh, yeah, this concept in today's episode. And we will be uh, diving into uh, what it is, uh, the implications it has on exercise selection, uh, the definition of stimulus and fatigue, as well as explaining uh, how we can estimate it and maximize it by choosing the right exercises uh, for us in our training to make our training for hypertrophy safer, more sustainable, and more effective. Mike only touches on the concepts as we don't want to give away too much uh, for his presentation here in Melbourne. But anyhow, guys, uh, that's enough on that. A few quick housekeeping things. Our contest prep uh, course, our physique contest prep course is open for enrollment. It starts next week, May 6th. If you're a coach or athlete who wants to learn more about contest prep, and how you can get the most out of your bodybuilding and physique endeavors, make sure you check it out. We have a number of highly reputable coaches uh, and athletes contributing to the course, and there's a whole heap of really useful and practical information uh, for diet, training, cardio, peaking, recovery, all the different phases of contest prep. Uh, It's a one-stop shop for anyone looking to better understand the contest prep and what it's all about. Uh, Also, we have a number of seminars coming up. We'll be in Adelaide in the coming weeks, then here in Melbourne, then we'll be traveling to Sydney, as well as Singapore and Bath in the UK. So myself, Lyndon and Martin are doing a whole bunch of presentations. If we are coming to a city near you, we'd love to see you there. And you can check out tickets in the description box below. But without further ado guys, here is Dr. Mike Isratel, and this is the JPS podcast and I hope you guys enjoy. That's awesome, man. So yeah, let's uh, talk about what you'll be presenting on uh, down under um, and for those uh, who are listening who may not be aware Mike is coming to uh, Melbourne in June 28th to the 30th for the Ultimate Evidence Based Conference uh, which a bunch of other quite intelligent fitness folk it's going to be a big weekend and Mike will be presenting on advanced hypertrophy but before we sort of get into that Um, and discuss uh, your presentation, give the folks a little bit of a teaser. You've been writing a book for the past, I think, it's probably been what seems like a lifetime, um, but for the past year or more, uh, called The Scientific Principles of Hypertrophy Training. And I thought, before we sort of get into the advanced hypertrophy stuff, uh, what are the big rocks, uh, I guess, that uh, people should know before they start focusing on the fringes um, or really getting into um, the the nuances of hypertrophy training that have come from this book that you've been writing? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, you know, uh, we could, I could, I could give you three of the biggest rocks and I think that would be very uh, good place to start. The biggest rock is uh, the principles, you know, the three most important principles to hypertrophy training as ranked by the total magnitude of their effect, right? Like how much of a difference do they make? If, can you still see me by the way? I can see you. You're, sh- right. you're shrinking by the minute, but um, I can see you just fine. I hate you. <laughs> I can no longer see you. So uh, that is give weird. me one second. Hopefully I don't turn this off. Oh, okay, we're good. All right. Cool. Um, I hit the screen share button by accident. Um, the biggest uh, principle is specificity. And it basically means 
uh, you know, whatever training you're doing, is that training specific to either what you want to grow or of triggering hypertrophy mechanisms? Like for example, I heard in high school that if you want big legs, you should run because runners have big legs. Now, forgetting the complete baffling ignorance of the fact that sprinters and endurance athletes have two very different size legs, um, you know, gee, I sure hope you're doing better than running if you want big legs. That if you want big legs, you should at least ask the question, the notion of, insofar as I'm trying to get big legs, what are the modalities that get me big legs? And somebody could say, well, you should squat because powerlifters do it. And it should, at the very least, ring off your skeptical bells and be like, but they're trying to get as strong as possible. And there might be, and there is a huge intersection between those two goals. But the, shouldn't you just be asking, what is it that makes my legs bigger? So specificity allows us to basically arrange two things. One, arrange a set of principles about which we make sure that all of our training is for muscle growth. And two, for whatever body parts we choose to want to grow, we can make sure that we're training those in the manner for growth and others either training in other manners or not training at all. So for example, you'll say, hey, I want a big upper body. And some people in the forums are like, you know, some kind of like, you know, ripto muscle forums or something We'll say like squats and milk, like, okay, we well, squats don't really grow biceps all that much. And certainly some peripheral activation, but gee, man, there's gotta be a more gourmet diet. Way. I think they call exactly. it on the, on the forums. Yeah. Yeah. But it's just like, you know, they say like 20 rep squats or whatever, or whatever 20 rep squats program, like they'll just grow your whole body. But it doesn't make any fucking sense. So, um, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, if you want bigger arms, you're going to probably have to train your arms more. Right. And so on and so forth. So specificity is king because specificity sort of um, boundaries all of our other training principles. Like the next one, for example, is the overload principle, which says we have to train hard and progressively harder. But what does hard mean? Like if you sprinted on the treadmill for 30 seconds and then the next week you sprinted for a minute, that's progressively harder for sure. But it's actually in a direction considerably away from optimal hypertrophy. Maybe uh, within uh, hypertrophy, you could sprint for 30 seconds this week and then sprint at an incline for 30 seconds next week. That would actually be more force, roughly the same amount of time uh, exertion. And that would actually, if you were going to run for hypertrophy, would translate much better to hypertrophy, right? So and that brings us to the second principle, most important, uh, which is the overload principle, right? And why is it second to specificity? Well, the overload principle says that you have to train hard in order to grow the most muscle you can. And... You have to train harder over time. Uh, it's a two-part definition. I mean, somebody could say, well, that seems to be more important than specificity, but it's not because marathon runners train hard by any standard, and they train harder over time. But they're getting less and less jacked the more they do it, not more and more. So specificity is king because it, it's, a, it's a huge green arrow on the road that points us into the direction. Overload is somewhat, uh, you could say, how fast we drive down that road. Um, and if you're in a race car, you had better be going fast and you had better be going faster than your competitors, right? So, uh, you, and, uh, they respond to speed up to your speed. So you have to outmaneuver them. And that's what overload is. You've got to train hard to present the muscles with a challenge. Technically that means train above your minimum effective volume, uh, per session per week, so on and so forth. And also progressively increase the difficulty, which usually means additions of volume, but also means addition of intensity, relative intensity, and so on. So those are your first two big rocks right there. Rock number three, rock the vote. So uh, from applying overload in a specific manner, we have two things that really occur. One is you accrue benefits. A stimulus uh, occurs, and uh, the stimulus makes you more jacked. Uh, but, uh, for whatever it's worth, unfortunately, otherwise in all systems, uh, every bit of stimulus comes with some bit of fatigue. And at some point uh, the fatigue is relatively harmless. At some point it begins to accumulate and then it accumulates to the levels that interfere in a variety of, uh, for a variety of reasons with the process of hypertrophy. And so that third big rock, third big principle is fatigue management is that not only should you be training for muscle growth, not only should you be training hard and harder, but every now and again, in your program, you should have an opportunity to bring down fatigue in order to clean the slate, so you, so to speak, so you can continue to train harder and harder. And especially at various parts of your program where you're gaining fatigue sort of needlessly and you could not be, or you could be doing a better job between getting as much stimulus for not as much fatigue, you should be doing that, and the fatigue management principle covers that. And that actually segues into exactly what I'll be talking about at the UEBC in Melbourne in um, at the end of June, 
which is a, a concept that was novel to me, at least anyway, I put a term to it, um, called the SFR, the stimulus to fatigue ratio. And I'm speaking about that concept specifically and about a uh, derivative concept of it and applying it to real world scena uh, scenarios. And uh, I don't know if I ranted enough, if you could ask me uh, any sort of follow-up questions or I could just get right into what the S SFR is. I don't want to give away, away too much, right? But uh, you let me know where to take this. Yeah, no, I thought uh, that was uh, brilliant. And I had an inkling that those three would be the uh, the big rocks or uh, some some uh, yeah, derivative of those three would be the, the key takeaways from the book, which, uh, yeah, it does segue into what you'll be covering at the UABC. Uh, and you'll specifically be talking about its implications on exercise selection, uh, defining it as well as, uh, explaining how we can estimate it, maximize it by choosing the right exercise, helps us get more uh, to keep training safe, uh, more sustainable, more effective, all those sorts of things. Uh, so let's first, start with definitions because I think that's uh, really important uh, when we're talking about uh, anything and just, uh, yeah, communicating. It's uh, really critical to get on the same page and make sure that we all understand uh, what people are talking about. Um, it's funny, I actually had a conversation with a friend of mine who's a doctor in um, psychology and we're talking about whether or not food addiction is real. Um, and we realized that we both had two completely different questions sure. that we were trying to answer. One was, is food addiction real and the other is is food addictive which are two completely different questions and it was uh, really important to make sure that we understood what we were talking about before we went any further so let's start with stimulus fatigue ratio what the fuck is it mike what are you yep. what are you coming up with here brother what are you on what are you on about what are you um, on about man sfr so, fucking all yeah. these acronyms and, and yeah, ratios and bullshit acronyms. come on man yeah what the fuck is science this? numbers <laughs> So basically, it's all uh, super fancy ratios and science shit, but it really comes down to some really, really simple shit. And I'll try to keep it super simple. There's plenty of time to make it more complex at the actual conference. But it's really not that complex. We have to define two separate concepts in order to find the stimulus to fatigue ratio. One is stimulus, the other is fatigue. Uh, stimulus is the extent to which any given repetition or set of an exercise uh, signals muscle growth to occur. That's, that is what it is in the technical sense. It can be measured in a variety of ways. It can be measured direct signaling, like the activation of uh, mTOR pathway and other such pathways. It can even be measured in the resultant short-term muscle growth that occurs. So you simulate, measure muscle growth over the course of several days at any various time points, and then you could get a proxy for stimulus like that. And then you sort of have an idea of, okay, like, you know, we did three sets of squats, and then three sets of leg extensions in another time, and both of them had, your per set, uh, a different amount of stimulus, let's say, for quad hypertrophy. It caused a different amount of muscle growth. Right? So that's the stimulus side. Any questions about that? It does seem pretty straightforward. Pretty straightforward. I know I'm Australian and a little bit slower uh, compared to, to most, but I, I'm with you, Mike. For sure. I'm barely with myself. Um, balls deep into a diet. I have no idea what I'm saying. <laughs> So, and then, and then we have the question of um, fatigue. What is fatigue, right? And fatigue can be defined operationally as a reduction in performance from session to session, right? Um, uh, eventually. So you, you know that you are recovered if you are performing at adequate levels, and you are not recovered if you are not performing at adequate levels. Uh, fatigue is cumulative, so it doesn't always immediately result in actual performance loss, but if you keep it up long enough, it will eventually impede performance. But really, fatigue at its base is the degree of muscle damage you sustain, the degree of depletion of glycogen and other uh, substrates that you need for energy, the degree of nervous system disruption that requires healing, the degree of connective tissue disruption, and the degree of hormonal disruption. All of these systems, you can analogize them to the dirt and gunk and dishes and pots everywhere that builds up in a busy restaurant kitchen. You know, the purpose of running a restaurant kitchen, the stimulus, so to speak, is how much good food comes out to the customer, right? The fatigue, so to speak, is how many dirty dishes we have, how much bullshit, is, how many you know, grapes have rolled under the, uh, the stove and how much gunk is on the, the frying pans and how many eggs are missing from the fridge and bread is missing from the fridge that we need to restock. So 
that's fatigue. And it can also be measured in a variety of ways. I, I can speak to those if you'd like. Um, but uh, one is there an easy proxy measure is like you do an exercise. How much do your joints hurt per given set of that exercise? Right. So like if you do squats with 300 kilos halfway down with poor technique, you're going to get some stimulus for sure. Quad stimulus from 300 kilo squats is going to be real. But gee, your joints are going to hurt, man, and you're going to be feeling that. Uh, we can also measure sort of the, the, the degree of uh, muscle soreness. We can measure fatigue and its systemic effects. So for example, if you have a workout of squats and then let's say bench presses and then rows, just to keep things really simple, if you do the 300 kilo squats halfway down, how much does that beat you up for doing bench presses and rows later versus doing, let's say, full range of ocean squats with good technique? Well, you know, it's probably a lot. So the amount of systemic fatigue you accrue in the short term from such an effort can be higher than other things. Like if someone told you, okay, you got to hit this big bench press for reps PR, but first you got to train legs. You're going to do squats, you're going to do leg extensions for five sets. You're like, are you fucking kidding me? Of course, leg extensions. Somebody asked why. Because well, they're not going to be that fatiguing to interfere with my bench press later, right? There's the systemic fatigue spillover, so to speak. It's just not going to be that high. So... What we now have is, an, is a definition for the stimulus an exercise uh, causes, and we have some proxy ways to measure that real world, uh, or estimate it really real world. I can speak to some of those later if you'd like. And then we have uh, the idea that uh, all exercises are to some extent fatiguing. Here's where the real big kicker comes in. This is the, it's almost the entire point of the entire stimulus to fatigue ratio concept. What you do is you put stimulus in the numerator. You put fatigue in the denominator, and you divide the two. And you get the stimulus to fatigue ratio. In other words, you get a number or an understanding about any exercise or any way of training or any technique between two exercises that gives you representation of how much muscle is probably being grown versus how much fatigue is being added. And the fatigue addition isn't just like, well, the fatigue is worth the muscle growth. It could be. But remember that our maximum recoverable volumes are limited by our systemic ability to sustain them. You don't have an infinite amount of fatigue. And also, even if your systemic limit isn't the case, as you train the muscle for longer and longer and longer, weeks and weeks and weeks, its fatigue eventually builds up to levels that are unsustainable and directly interfere with hypertrophy, even if the stimulus is still really good. So in other words, if your fatigue is lower for any given unit of stimulus, not only can you maybe get the same muscle growth in the first couple of weeks from uh, an exercise that has more fatigue donation, but as much stimulus or even more, but you can train for longer and make more headway on progressive overload with an exercise that is not as fatiguing. Like if someone said, okay, you got to do sumo, uh, blow bar, partial squats with your knees hanging out in front with 300 kilos uh, plus every workout, or you get to do like leg presses with a full range of motion, super good technique, relatively manageable weight uh, with a machine that's really sort of tailored to your body design. It doesn't cause you any joint stress. So how many weeks can you pound away at those fucking shitty squats until you just can't, just can't do it anymore uh, versus how many weeks can you pound away progressively at the leg presses? You know, more. And we all know, and you're, you're definitely experienced enough to know this personally, muscle is built over weeks and weeks and weeks of summative progressive quality training. Uh, you know, people say like, oh man, I had a great leg session. It's interesting on a sort of personal note. I'm always I'm not taken aback by that, but there's always a big skeptical asshole part of me that when someone makes too many posts like that on the social media, like amazing session, it's like, yeah, okay. You grew a little bit of muscle, sweet. How many of those have you sequenced? You know, I'm, a, I'm a lot more scared of the competitor or scared, impressed by the muscularity of a competitor or a fellow athlete of mine that maybe he talks about his workouts, but I, I, I'm freaked out about the guy who posts his Instagram workouts and, and every week he's got another two and a half kilos on the bar with really good technique and maybe one or two extra sets of reps. Uh, I'm scared of that guy. For eight weeks, he pounds away. You're like, fuck, that guy's legs are getting bigger. There's just no way around it. But a guy that's like, amazing workout, you don't hear from him much because you know it was too amazing and his fatigue got too high and he had to take a deload or his knee hurt. Then you know, I'm not super really impressed by that guy. So in other words, the stimulus to fatigue ratio becomes this incredibly powerful tool to assess any exercises or any other training modalities, but we can talk about exercises specifically that basically tell you, hey, look, like how worth it is this exercise? And believe it or not, you can take exercises, you can sort of uh, 
relatively quantitatively assess your own stimulus to fatigue ratios for those exercises and the individual techniques, for example, wider stance versus closer stance leg press for you, for your quads, which one is better. You can give them all SFR estimates, and then you can rank all of them on their SFRs, right? So whichever ones have the highest stimulus to fatigue ratios, those are just your better exercise. So when people ask me on Instagram, hey, why are you doing these rows versus this rows? Hey, what do you think about this technique versus that technique? Almost my shortest answer could be because this is one of my top three SFR variants. And, and that's it. And then, and then I do another exercise in there, but that's a different one. I'd be like, yep, it's just one of the top three variants. And just due to the principle of variation, I rotate them every several months. But when they ask me, why don't you do this other exercise I've never seen you do, the answer is almost always, uh, short of like my gym doesn't have that piece of equipment, is it just doesn't rank well for me because of my body structure, so on and so forth, and my needs on very highly in SFR. Or in other words, it just doesn't outrank a bunch of other exercises that I'd rather be doing. It's kind of like, um, I don't know, you, you travel plenty. You, go, you get to a gym somewhere when you travel and someone's like, you know, hey, you got to check out this back machine, this rolling machine. It's really funky. And you check it out, but it just doesn't fit your body. It kind of like fucking just hurts your elbows and you're not really getting a pump. And you're like, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go do barbell rows. And someone's like, dude, you're in this fucking gym. Why don't you just use this machine? Variation. Like variation is an important principle. It sure as hell doesn't beat overload. It sure as hell doesn't beat fatigue management. And SFR is a unifying concept between overload and fatigue management, right? And specificity, funny enough. So it's like this is the golden fleece of hypertrophy training. So somebody would be like, why are you doing barbell rows? I mean, you got that machine. You'd be like, oh, that machine objectively sucks compared to barbell rows. So novelty just doesn't go far enough. At the end of the day, you got to look at SFR. Awesome, man. And in terms of quantifying uh, and allocating uh, specific numbers uh, to an exercise for uh, both the numerator stimulus and the denominator fatigue, uh, you know, I guess some objections to that would be that, hey, it's just an arbitrary number. Like, how do you actually know? Because, you know, it's very hard to measure mTOR pathway signaling if you're just an everyday gym goer and you don't even know what that freaking means. It could be difficult uh, to even quantify measurable changes in muscle growth, or that could take a really long time. And it's like, how do you then discern which exercise is stimulating that growth if you've got four different chest variations. Uh, so, so what I'm getting at is, um, you know, how do we um, quantify uh, the numeric value of stimulus and fatigue in practice from a very pragmatic sense? Yeah, uh, for, yeah. for example, how do you go about uh, saying, hey, the barbell row for me is, you know, a two to one ratio of stimulus versus fatigue? Like, how do you get to those numbers? Yeah, so let me give you... Um... Uh, is it okay if I give you, would you like one or two examples from both stimulus and fatigue? One or two? Because I don't want to, I have five in the lecture. I don't want to give them all the way. So what let's, do you think? One or two? Fuck them. These podcast freeloaders, man. Give them one. Give them one. Fucking freeloaders, hey. Eh? <laughs> no, I'm giving right. them two. Give them two. We give like two. you guys. Okay. Give them two. So, okay. <laughs> So uh, here's, here's, here's two of really, really big ones for growth stimulus. These are proxies. So they're not perfect, but they start to give us a little bit of information. Here's the thing. Um, there's actually a, a theoretical concept in economics called for perfect information. It's a fucking stupid concept because there's no such thing as perfect information. All information you get about any system at any environment at any time is always marginal. Okay? There's a certain chance it's going to be true, a certain chance it's going to be false. There's a certain quality to the information. There's a certain amount. Okay? You're, not, you're not ever going to be omniscient, but you can get further and closer away to omniscience. So these proxy variables are not perfect and they're not even close, but insofar as they give us any value, they are valuable because they're better than a random guess. And so here's two of them for the growth stimulus. First proxy that I can talk about is um, the pump. Do you get a pump in the target muscle when you're doing this exercise? And the more intelligent way to ask that question is, how many working sets close to failure, you know, four RIR or less, does it take to get a certain amount of pump? For example, if you just, you just love easy bar curls, they're just built for your body, right? And we're comparing easy bar curls versus like a cable curl attachment that you have. And the, the cable, you know, it's just grips in the wrong place. It's the only place that there's grips. After three sets of uh, easy bar curls, your biceps are swollen up like gal, like boom, like, like, oh my God, if something's going on in there. 
versus like five sets into cable curls, you're like, I don't feel a fucking thing. And you're going close to failure and everything. It's just not, there's just something not happening in the biceps, right? You see, like you've done chest press machines where you're like, I don't think this is working my chest. And they're like, really? You're like, I feel my front delts a lot. I feel my tricep. Is it the angle is all wrong? You could also change the chair in a machine, like the chair height, a little higher, and you feel your pecs a lot, a little lower, and you feel your your shoulders, and you're like, I don't know, man. I just don't feel my pecs. So if we let you have, you know, the diff- different chair heights for a chest press machine, one of them gets you pumped in three sets. One of them it takes six sets to get you as pumped, right? So you, you can tell if the fatigue from the sets is the same, you got a problem because you're doing double the work for the same pump. And what does the pump mean? Well. The pump likely indicates homeostatic disruption, which itself causes or correlates with hypertrophy, but also the the muscle pump uh, has been established to mechanistically cause muscle growth. Cell swelling causes muscle growth in the physical sense. So the pump is not just an empty variable. And it is also, the pump is also indicative to some extent of your minimum effective volume. Like if you're not getting a pump at all, it's by no means clear you're really getting a whole lot of hypertrophy. And think about all the best hypertrophy training modalities, high volumes, Lots of sets, myo reps, drop sets, um, super sets. Those all cause a pump. Can you think of anything that grows muscle reliably over the long term and doesn't cause a pump? Yeah, like hamstrings might grow from sets of five, but that, those are more the exceptions than the rules, right? right. So, so then we have, speaking of hamstrings, we have another indicator of growth stimulus. And this is an interesting one because it's probably not a direct indicator itself, or at the very least, not a big one. But it's a proxy for are we hitting the muscle in the right kind of way that's actually stimulating the muscle. And that is, uh, how many sets does it take to produce notable delayed onset muscle soreness? So for example, and this is a purely exploratory use of this, if you were to tell someone that, hey, listen, you know, if you do lunges this way, it hits your glutes. And they're like, okay. But if you do them this way, it hits your quads. And the purpose of the session is to try to hit your quads. They're like, okay, got it. And you show them your quad way of lunges. And they do like four sets and you're like, you're going to be fucked up. I'm telling you, you're going to be sore. And they're like, okay. And the two days later, they're like, I got enough. And you're like, well, shit, I, well, let's try the glute way. Maybe we'll get your glutes sore. They come back two days later after four sets of the glute lunges. And they're like, my quads are torched. And you're like, huh. Now, how is it that we incur delayed onset muscle soreness into the quads? It has to be via resisted muscle activation. Like the muscle had to be on and it had to be resisting being eccentrically stretched at at least, or had to itself have done a lot of work, it was stimulated. Now, if there's a considerable amount of DOMS, a lot of DOMS, it was probably overstimulated. You're probably not getting the best hypertrophy. So DOMS is not one of those variables that's the more the merrier. But if you can get really robust delayed onset muscle soreness from three sets of an exercise versus another exercise that takes you 10 sets to get robust muscle soreness, gee, you know, that second exercise probably doesn't grow as much muscle. And if you think about it, every single exercise you know grows a shitload of muscle kind of makes you fucking sore with not that much work. And the key is not to go overboard and get as sore as possible, but to just do less of that exercise because you have to. For example, big hamstrings, how do you get them? Stiff legged deadlifts, good mornings, shit like that. How many sets of that shit do you need to get sore? Fuck, man, one and a half or some shit if you're just starting out. Versus how many sets does it take of like bullshit light leg curls with a half range of motion to get sore? You could do like 10 of those and be like, I just don't feel my hamstring. I didn't feel my hamstring for the first five years of my leg training because I had no fucking clue what I was doing. So you take those two together. You go, okay, how many sets does it take for me to get a pump in this exercise? How many takes sets does it take for me to get notable soreness? There's a few other ones, three other ones that I'll be mentioning at the conference. You get all those together and you sort of do like a one, two, three checklist, like, or, or just how many sets it takes, or just a one, two, three, like, is it really soreness inducing exercises like a three and a really non inducing exercise, like it takes you forever to get sore as a one or something. So you just rank them on a scale and that starts to give you an idea about how stimulative that exercise is. And if an exercise, like, imagine we found an exercise that one set of it, got you fucking crazy pumped and mega sore. Would you be interested in hypothesizing that that exercise does not grow muscle well? I would not be interested in taking that side of the path, right? So the, 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 that's an example of estimating growth stimulus by proxy variables, and there's a couple of more of them. Either one of them by themselves, I wouldn't put too much stock in it. All five of the ones, at least two of the ones I talked about now, and all five of the ones I'll be mentioning at the UBC in late June, If you put all five of them together and they all point in the same direction, like, yes, this is very stimulative, 
gee, you know, you got one hell of an argument. And this is no longer like, oh, it's arbitrary. It's difficult to measure. It's like, man, there's really probably something going on here. You know, there, there really just is. And then on the fatigue side, we can look at a couple of examples. Um, one is, uh, let's see which ones I want to list. Um, how much joint and connective tissue soreness exists in that, uh, joints used in that exercise in the days after you train, right? This is a proxy for fatigue. And it's not much of a proxy because it's really kind of more of a measurement, you know, um, Let's say you have leg presses and you have hack squats and someone's like, which one's better for you? And let's say they have the same rough stimulus, but every time after you do hack squats, your knees and your hips are sore for two or three days. And every time you do leg presses, they just don't get sore. Only your muscles get sore. Which one do you think adds the most fatigue over time? I mean, it's almost, almost a comical question to ask. None of this is fucking rocket science. And then the other example, and there's three more others that I'm not going to mention is a very interesting one of how much perceived effort do you have to put in per set, right? So for example, uh, we were, you know, we like to talk shit about isolation movements and say, well, you know, leg curls or like, let's say leg extensions are a waste of your time because they're so easy. Yeah, but the real question you have to ask is how much muscle do they grow per set? Because if they grow plenty of muscle per set, just not as much as like let's say squats or something. But the next question is how difficult are they per set? You know, you get under a squat bar, you're in for some shit. Psychologically, neurologically, systemically, locally, it fucks you up. It's, a, it, it's the perceived fatigue just psychologically is fucking gnarly, right? Like you're like, fuck, I'm really lifting weights now. You know, I don't want to die. And that psychological perceived fatigue or perceived level of effort that you have to give, you know, like that gutsy shit, but like, let's wake up. That is a finite resource. You have a sum of it to dope out for every rep, set, session, and week and month and probably career length. You only have so much of that shit. And it regenerates, but it regenerates in a finite way. So if you can get the same amount of stimulus for less literal perceived effort, at the very least, you could probably just do more of that shit and use up. Nobody's saying you got to take the easy way out. You can take just as hard of a way out except squeeze in eight sets of leg presses for which you would otherwise do four sets of sumo squats. You get maybe the same amount of quad hypertrophy, uh, but with less you know, total perceived stimulus or, you know, four to four. But if you do eight sets of leg presses, you get double the quad hypertrophy, but your perception of effort is identical because eight sets of leg presses probably sucks just as much as four sets of really heavy sumo squats. But that perception of effort and other fatigue uh, of factors like it it matters. So coming back to the original concept, let's say you found an exercise that gives you fucking gnarly pumps, gets you sore with fucking minimal effort, is easy as fuck to do and doesn't touch your joints at all. You'd have to be nuts not to use that exercise. But if let's imagine an exercise that's a high ranking SFR exercise, right? Because the stimulus is high, the fatigue is low, the uh, ratio of enumerator denominator is really good, you know, like a nine or I don't know, an eight or some shit. And, and then what do you do if the ratio is like one over eight? Can you imagine that? Somebody asking you like, hey, so what do you think of like these, uh, these sumo squats you're doing? You're like, well, you know, I don't really ever get sore from them. I, I probably have to do like 10 times the volume to actually get quad soreness from these. My hips hurt a lot when I do them. Um, you know, what else? Uh, you know, my, uh, my fucking pump. They're like, how's your pump? You're like, I don't even know what that means. I've never gotten a quad pump from these things. And then they're like, so, but yeah, but it's pretty easy though, right? You're like, no, man, I got to fucking, I got to get into these sets because I was these crushing weight. It's going to kill me. Uh, it just takes everything out of me emotionally and I can barely train, you know, whatever body part I have later has to be a small body part because it zaps me that much. You know, is someone going to listen to you say that and be like, yeah, man, that sounds like a great exercise. It sounds like an awful exercise. Uh, and, and power lifters have the unfortunate circumstance of weight lifters of being constrained to having to do the three competitive or two competitive movements. Like, I don't care if you don't like clean and jerks or how systemically fatiguing they are, which by the way, they're very systemically fatiguing. Um, you just got to do them. But for hypertrophy training purposes, especially non-sport specific hypertrophy, bodybuilding and just getting more jacked, gee, you know, you really should try to find your higher SFR exercises because that really is the sort of the golden fleece of exercise selection in, in training. And, and just, I'll just add one more thing while I'm ranting, technique differences. And I'll talk, be talking about this at great length during the seminar. Technique differences are huge. 
because changing your technique in an exercise can wildly change your SFR. People ask me why I do these like, you know, high bar squats with these slow eccentrics sitting all the way down with big chest uh, and I don't lean over and crunch my abs down to like lift more weight. Well, if I generate a super big block, right, a super big um, core and uh, what's that called? Bracing. If I brace super fucking hard. Um, instead of keeping my back more lordotic and letting the weight sit straight down like an Olympic weightlifter, um, I am able to lift more weight, but I'm lifting that weight now with posterior chain muscles and gluteal muscles that I'm actually not really trying to target because they have their own multiple sessions and exercises that I target them with that are also high SFR. But the way I squat, staying mostly upright and going full range of motion, it lets me eke out a shitload of stimulus from squats with actually just not that much fatigue. Mm -hmm. Versus if I widen my stance, people say like, hey, you know, Doc, if you widen your stance and you fucking brace better and you switch to low bar, you could squat 300 for reps. Yeah, that's probably true. And, and, and for what purpose? Um, to get Where's probably the stimulus? Almost it's not on the quads, which maybe, is the intended Maybe no purpose. stimulus. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You maybe have less stimulus in the quads, but let's say the same with just multiples more fatigue. Yeah. So uh, it, does this make – now, does this make the case that isolations are better than compounds? No way. Because compounds almost always have higher stimuli, but they also have higher fatigue. So on average, the SFRs of compounds and isolations are probably relatively evenly matched. And then it's just a matter of figuring out which ones fit in your program, how. But specific compounds versus others and specific techniques versus others have big differences in SFR, and those are super important. Outside of the obvious uh, benefits of this concept to picking exercises that fit you well for muscle growth. Um, I've obviously uh, realized as you've been explaining the concept uh, that I apply this uh, forethought of how can I minimize uh, fatigue, uh, you know, get more stimulus when somebody is in hypocaloric dieting phases for long durations where they're uh, ability to uh, recover, uh, not just uh, you know in general due to lack of uh, energy and nutrients coming in, but just you know decreasing fat mass, their joints get more beat up over time, uh, their motivation and effort towards training just takes a huge hit. Um, in for example, a contest prep like what you're in, uh, being able to you know select exercises that still get a stimulus. Um, but are just of way lower perceived effort per set can be extremely useful because you know somebody doesn't want to be loading up uh, you know a barbell with four to five plates per side when they're you know nine months into a contest prep and they're you know dick skin lean like that's just not you know something that's going to be enjoyable and that's going to be really demotivating for a lot of people to go to the gym and have to do that across multiple exercises for example but if you could get like a similar stimulus and just have them you know put a few plates down um on a you know machine or just you know load up a leg press for example it's, it's a lot easier um you know there's just a lot less effort not only within the set but also in terms of uh you know setting up the exercise as well and i think um you know using that as a proxy to to be able to select exercises, not just based on overall which exercises fit you best, but based on your uh, circumstances at any given point in time in, that will affect uh, your perception of effort, I think would be uh, extremely beneficial. And having this kind of model to assess that, uh, yeah, I can see a lot of utility uh, in you know various dieting phases and, and whatnot. Totally. One, one interesting uh, implication of what you just said is uh, the concept that I, I delve into considerably more in the book. I don't actually go into this in the lectures, I don't believe, but I field questions about it, um, is the idea of, uh, so there's a couple of very related concepts and they sort of string one from the, one from the other. Uh, there's a, a concept that precedes SFR, just, just called raw stimulus magnitude. And it's just, uh, who gives a shit about fatigue? How much muscle does this exercise grow? And that is a very important question to ask for several reasons. One of them is your off season, your calories are high, you've mm. moved a lot of your other muscles to maintenance or minimum effective volume, so you have room. Fatigue's not a real concern. You just have to, the judges said, look, you need bigger quads or you're just never gonna take first. It isn't, you gotta move everything out of the way so fatigue's not limiting and just do what fucks your quads up. You give hell, high water, fatigue, doesn't matter. 
But that's certainly going to be a different question than when SFR comes into play. And SFR comes into play, look, if, if, we, if we as humans had no fatigue constraint at all, raw stimulus magnitude would be the only thing you would care about. But humans sometimes have not much fatigue or constraint, like you're off season, you're eating a lot, and you've moved a lot of body parts around to maintenance and no effective. And then you can focus more on raw stimulus. Uh, versus uh, sometimes we're more fatigue constrained, like you said, pre-contest. Mm. And when you're very fatigue constrained, that's when SFR becomes really, yeah. really, really important. Because someone could say, yeah, well, I see you're doing leg presses and stuff, but wouldn't you grow more muscle squatting? And you would say, yes, if I could recover, but I can't. Yeah. So I'm taking the second best option, which is the first best in this case, because the option of accruing that much fatigue is not an option. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, very, uh, very cool stuff. I'm interested to uh, hear this lecture when you're uh, down in Melbourne. And in terms of, uh, yeah, just building off that a little bit, um, what are the implications of various rep ranges? Because I guess there's a couple of assumptions that we make when we uh, use any uh, model such as uh, SFR because we would want to be comparing apples to apples, you know, for example, and uh, using rep ranges, RPEs, uh, number of sets uh, to standardize things so that we can say, okay, you know, three sets of eight at an R RIR of two on the squat uh, gives me, a, you know, way better stimulus, uh, but also more fatigue than say a leg press, three sets of eight, uh, you know, RIR of two. Um, but obviously exercises are self-selecting towards certain rep ranges. It's not a perfect world. And some people are just going to feel greater stimulus in different rep ranges. So how, because there would be a lot of trial and error in obviously playing around with different rep ranges. If somebody's doing three sets of eight on an easy bar curl, it's like, yeah, not, not a lot of people are going to feel wicked pumps uh, in their biceps with three sets of eight. You'll get the genetic freaks who will just like absolutely blow up you know, pretty much doing any any form of curl. But then most people are generally, the more reps they do, they get to those higher rep ranges, they'll start feeling like some serious pumps, you know, above 10. Just makes sense. It's a, you know, more, uh, yes, hypertrophy and swelling, uh, yeah, stimulating rep range. But how do people then use this concept um, with various rep ranges to determine uh, which is better because I guess it would be confusing when you like, you know, do sets of 15 to 20. It's like, oh, I get great pumps on the leg press doing 15 to 20 reps. Um, and it seems to be, you know, very favorable in terms of uh, stimulus, not a lot of, uh, you know, fatigue. Um, but the squat, I also feel, uh, you know, great pumps, but you know, only when I'm around, you know, eight to 10 reps, uh, for example, and the fatigue similar yeah, to yeah. the leg press, like, how do I know? Uh, which is actually, you know, in the grand scheme of things, a more beneficial exercise. So first of all, you don't actually have to know that. You already have enough information to be actionable. Mm -hmm. uh, if you know that leg, that your your squats feel best, of all the rep ranges, they feel their highest SFR at 8 to 10 reps, and leg presses get their highest SFR at roughly 20 reps, you already have information to go on. So if someone says, hey, you want a leg press? And you're like, yeah, we'll do a mass cycle. Like, what weight do you want to use? Well, like, well, you know what weight because you know where you get your best results, right? So already you have enough information to accurately program. There's no need to compare squats to leg presses on a, a totalic, totalic basis because that's not how you program. Like yeah. you don't have to do squats and leg presses. I was with, also referring say, to if an exercise feels better at 8 to 12 versus other rep ranges, like within that exercise as well as then, you know, piece, yeah. piecing together the entirety totally. of the picture. Yeah. So within the exercise – you could say, okay, you're basically uh, sort of alluding to the fact that potentially this index biases towards higher reps and, and stuff like that because they seem to be the ones with the pump and, and so on and so forth. What he didn't mention was the three of the other indices, at least a couple of them, actually biased to the lower rep ranges. I'm not going to reveal what they are, but there's ways of assessing that heavyweights just straight up beat lightweights, right? Um, so it is a holistic scale that covers all the rep ranges. In addition to that, per muscle, per individual, per fiber type distribution, and even per exercise, there is a topography of rep ranges which is more and less favorable. And uh, the result isn't that you should train at only that rep range. 
The result is uh, from research and theory, you should train in a diversity of rep ranges, but your diversity should be biased in one way or another to the rep range areas that seem to be the most beneficial. So for example, you could say, okay, when I leg press in the five to 10 rep range, I just have kind of a lot of knee pain and hip pain. I don't get dick. If I leg press in the 10 to 20 rep range, I seem to get fucking amazing pumps and all this other great shit and all of it's high SFR. If I leg press in the 20 to 30 rep range, my feet start to hurt being on platform so much, I just get tired and out of breath and I don't really get a whole lot of anything. It's like cardio. When I do leg extensions, five to 10 is just dumb. 15 to 20 is okay, but 20 to 30, or drop sets and stuff, that's where I really feel leg extensions help. And then in squats, anything north of 10 reps just starts to be cardio and my back starts to give out and I start to round over and it's not really even a thing anymore. So there's nothing wrong with that, right? That is a ton of information you use immediately to say, okay, when I'm doing my rep range spectrum training, uh, a session, let's say we took instructor, we don't have to do this a session, this could be over the course of a week. Let's use a better example is over the course of a week. Monday, I do squats in the five to 10 range. Wednesday, I do leg presses in the 10 to 20 range. And Friday, I do leg extensions in the 20 to 30 range. Boom, problem solved, right? So when you have data that says a certain exercise has a higher SFR in a certain rep range, that's good data. That's good data. You just have to find other exercises that are better SFRs in the other rep ranges that you also have to train. So you have to make that kind of match. For example, somebody could say that hamstring curls in the five to 10 rep range are really fucking stupid. I totally agree. I don't feel a fucking thing. You know, you just feel like it's, ow, or, I don't know, like something's happening. I don't want to rip my hamstring off the bone. It's an isolation move. Six reps. That's just ridiculous. But uh, the same people will tell you that if you do stiff legged deadlifts with anything over 10 reps, it's just a lower back fatigue exercise and you can't even feel your hamstrings anymore. So we have a very complementary sort of association there where we have both sides taken care of, which is why good hypertrophy programming typically has heavy hip hinges and lighter leg uh, curls to make up the difference. Um, and per muscle, per individual, some muscles, because of their fiber distribution, prefer certain rep ranges and concomitantly the exercises sometimes that go with them. So for example, uh, in many individuals, hamstrings tend to be a little bit more fa fast fiber distribution than slower fiber distribution. So a lot of times, if you really try to train someone uh, and train their hamstrings in the higher rep ranges, uh, if you do a lot of reps, they don't actually get like a good pump and they don't get really sore. They just get tired. And you're like, I don't know what the fuck we're doing. It's like, you know, you're like, oh, you like high rep legs? Like, yeah, well, let's go run around the block 10 times. But that's not going to make you, that's not going to hit the stimulus very well. But on the other hand, for those individuals who have a faster twitch hamstrings, uh, sets of five to 10 in the good morning, in the stiff legged deadlift, and so on and so forth, uh, weighted back raise, uh, man, do they fuck your shit up, like DOMS and all this other stuff I won't mention, indicators of stimulus. And all of a sudden, it's like, holy shit, like, yeah, I guess that makes a lot of sense. And you're supposed to train these muscles at an average of a lower rep range because faster fibers probably respond best to higher degrees of mechanical loading and worse to the other uh, growth modalities. So it, it all ends up making sense in the end. It's all very good information. What you do have to do, I think, is give some things justice. So don't find a rep range for an exercise that works well and never explore outside of it. You may be pleasantly surprised. I used to think that my hamstrings were like the fastest switch thing on the planet. Then I tried full range of motion, properly controlled seated and lying leg curls in How, how long did you lose me for? I can't hear your audio. Oh, there we go. Five seconds. Okay. So I used to think my hamstrings were super fast twitch, but then I figured out how to do properly controlled full range of motion, lying and seated leg curls with relatively short rest breaks in the uh, first set was in the 20 to 30 rep range. And boy, did I get a lot of the, I get a great pump, great dom, so on and so forth. And over time, it's resulted in very great hypertrophy. So sometimes branching out is a really good idea. And also trying to bludgeon something that clearly doesn't work is also a concomitantly bad idea. So people say 20 rep squats and 20 rep squats are fucking stupid. Like they're fucking stupid. Um, they're great for building manhood or whatever, but you can just like run into a wall with your face first, a bunch and that the builds manhood just the same, or go join a MMA club or jujitsu club. And uh, that builds manhood just fine. And, you know, quads are built better through squats that probably no more than 15 reps at a time. And then for everything higher rep, you want leg presses. Everything really high rep, you want leg extensions. So 
both both sides, uh, you know, you want to have the rep diversity for sure within the week, probably within the month. And you want to make sure that you're giving just desserts to exercises to make sure you're not ruling things out just because one side feels good or one end of the rep range feels good. But you're also not pounding your face against the wall doing stuff that doesn't work. So, for example, like I used to try to do a lot of high rep incline dumbbell presses for chest. And what I realized after probably about two months of being an idiot is my forearms uh, would just give out before anything. Like it would just, my, my grip, like my hands would start to hurt and just accumulate lactate. And I was like, I can't hold a fucking dumbbell and do this for this long. I switched to barbell presses. Oh my God. Amazing. And all of a sudden all the higher reps, which I thought were stupid, produced some pretty decent results not the best results, but pretty decent. So it was like, well, why the, what the fuck was I doing this whole time? And if I had been ranking on stimulus to fatigue, I would have been ranking relatively low. Should have been doing that. Yeah, I really, I really like that. And I, I guess a couple of thoughts that I have is that, number one, anyone who is sensible with their training uh, will understand and appreciate that exercises lend themselves better to certain rep ranges than others. Um, and I guess that this concept, uh, the SFR uh, concept, can help tease out uh, why that is, which exercises are better for us in certain rep ranges, um, and all of those sorts of things. So I think it's really useful. And I also, uh, and I'm sure you'll agree, we, we know so little about muscle hypertrophy that these kind of concepts are pivotal for coaches and athletes to help fill in the gaps while we, I guess, wait uh, patiently for, for more research to come out. Um, and it, it's very cool to see. And I'm definitely excited not only for obviously the lecture in Melbourne, but for uh, the book you're writing because it's something that we need. Uh, there's just so little uh, known or there's, there's very little quality information out there uh, covering hypertrophy in its entire yeah, organized. Yeah and, yeah. and, and, and organizing it. It's a lot of it's in drips and drabs. Like you can read an article on exercise selection. Uh, you can lean, read about like training volume through your books. You can listen to a podcast, but there's still nothing that logically sequentially structures and organizes from the ground up what you need to do to build muscle. And yeah. these concepts are great and very interesting to talk about in isolation. Um, but I'm super excited to, to read uh, your book and see everything laid out uh, in a very thought out and yeah, well-organized manner. So that's really cool. The book's going to be really sweet. Yeah, um, I will say, mention one really quick thing. Uh, SFRs actually sometimes differ by RIR. Yeah. So here's yeah, a real yeah. trick. So if you do leg extensions and you stop at four RIR, they're almost a complete waste of your time because all the only good things in a leg extension happen close to failure. On the other hand, with uh, stiff-legged deadlifts, RIR zero to one is just you trying not to die and you don't even feel your hamstrings anymore. Like this literally, would... you're just in incurring fatigue. So RIR two or three is the highest I'll ever go for those exercises and that's where all the growth is. And that would generally now, it's all uh, be determined type. within the rep range as well. It's like we know through the literature that you know 20 plus reps, if you're not taking that to failure, you're pretty much wasting your fucking time. Whereas totally. between five and 10 reps, we start to see uh, stimulation or greater stimulation of hypertrophy, um, you know, basically from five for sure. RIR upwards. For sure. But we can even take it a little bit further. Like if you have a really good machine, like Smith machine squat or even a free squat, going up to zero and one RIR in the squat is still highly stimulative mm -hmm. to the quads, probably more and more so because you don't like use your quads less and less the closer you get to failure. But in a very technically uh, demanding exercise like a stiff like a deadlift, et cetera, where moving the weight from point A to point B and doing it with the best technique are actually roads that cross each other at a certain RER. They're not aligned completely. Like with squatting, like if your technique breaks down, you just can't lift the weight anymore. Yeah. But with stiff like a deadlift, you can always just bend the knees a little bit more around the back a little bit yeah. more and the weight comes up. So that's one of those exercises in which its SFRs are best with not the lowest RIRs in the world. Yeah. Where other exercises, if you don't That's get cool. that RIR super close, then you're just kind of fucking moving around. Yeah, yeah. That's really cool. And before you rudely cut into my discussion about your book, um, I was going to ask you, uh, in piecing together all of this, is there anything that you've thought about, wanted to write about, but realize that, hey, we just don't, fucking know enough yet to be able to write about that or that you just weren't confident in putting into a book because 
as I was saying, we, do, we don't know a hell of a lot about muscle growth. We're still figuring it all out, meaning that in writing such a detailed book, there is a lot of um, you know, connecting dots based on uh, you know, your knowledge of uh, you know, sports science, physiology, all of those things. Like you would be making not leaps of faith, but you would be applying what you know in combination with your experience. And it's like, hey, this is my best guess at what we need to do for muscle growth when it comes to exercise selection because there's there's like you know a lot of the concepts you're talking about now mike you know nobody's spoken about that in the scientific literature not not in the uh you know specific application to uh, muscle growth that i know of anyway so how do you discern what is something that you're really confident in teasing out and putting into a book versus okay cool this is what i do in practice with me and my clients but I'm just not 100% sure as to you know, whether it's going to hold up. Well, there's two answers to that. One is we generally only include concepts for lengthy discussion which have a consilience of evidence behind them. Mm-hmm. And consilience of evidence, uh, and really we use evidence in the broad term, is you have some, some empirical data about mechanisms, some empirical data about actual effects, um, and a lot of theoretical backbone to say, man, it's, it's really probably got to be pretty similar to this because we know anything about the theory of how muscle grows or how biological organisms respond. And uh, one of the last pieces of the consilience puzzle is, is this anything like people actually do in the field and get yeah. success out of, or, or at the very least, are there not huge contraindications? Like, well, everyone who's tried that sucked and couldn't do it. An example is, um, there's a recent article about, uh, you know, you can, you can do deadlift every day, or sorry, no, it was a the deadlifts, it was a PubMed article, the deadlifts don't fatigue you any more than squats or benches. A, a, you know, the, that's a research finding they made, and a sample of, you know, 20 or so odd people, it's total garbage. It's a total waste of time. I could, I could take shits pet an article like that. Like, it was, you know, all kudos to the people that authored it. They found what they found. That's science, right? But the thing is, that if you expect a result like that to get replicated, you're ignoring every single power lift that's ever lifted. Not just like, oh, these are power lifters. This is what they do. They're all bros. Like, every intelligent power lifter, every of the smartest power lifters, every one of the best coaches, when they have programmed for their clients, myself included, Try to run under the assumption that there's no good reason we can think that why the deadlift should be so systemically fatiguing, but it just fucking is, right? It's just like, so if you manage to put together some ideas that check all of those boxes at least somewhat, then uh, that's point A, you can talk about them. Point B is to what extent and what level of confidence do you talk about them? So as we go from our earlier chapters to our later chapters, specifically ones on phase potentiation and the grand theory of periodization, our tone changes, not just the tone, the language, and actually most of the book is really called in the same language, but it's the degree changes that, you know, these are uh, non-dogmatic ideas for you to consider. They are potential ways to structure training that make some good sense. And they are almost certainly not the only ways to structure training, and they may not even be the best ways after we do more careful research and analysis. But this is probably a good idea, and it's worth, if not your experimentation, it's worth your consideration. And that's it. So the, every single thing you'll ever read on anything has a range of the degree to which it extrapolates from current evidence, right? in a very technical empirical sense, because muscle research was not done on you specifically, you can't actually apply any studies to yourself. We say, well, you know, you know, Bjornstrom et al. found, well, that was on Finnish teenagers. You are not Finnish, you are not a teenager. So I don't know why you're doing sets of 10, because they found that it works, but you're an idiot. Well, it turns out humans have quite a bit in common physiologically, so on and so forth, so you make various extrapolations. Logical extrapolations, necessary extrapolations. Do we make some extrapolations in the book that are pretty out there? Yeah, a few. Do we try at every step to say, hey, this is an extrapolation? Absolutely, we go out of our way to do that. Um, and everything we, we have that has literature, we cite. <laughs> right? So we have bibliographies the other chapter that are fucking massive, so if you want more peer-reviewed literature, you can go find it. As a matter of fact, our book and... This is something that uh, Brad certainly knows about, but uh, the plan, and this is going to be executed almost certainly, is that the forward to our book will actually be, hey, here's a couple of books you should read before you can get to our book. And one of them is Brad Schoenfeld's hypertrophy textbook. I, if I you're remember not well you mentioning in this the, on Revive yeah, Strongly, yeah. Yeah, if you're not well versed in the science of hypertrophy, our book's going to confuse the living fuck out of you. This book is not built for the beginner. It's just not. Uh, it is for the advanced reader, or so someone like yourself, uh, you'll read it, uh, Jacob and I have no doubt you're going to put it down and be like, wow, that was fucking awesome. And then you're going to be like, 
man, I'd love to refer it to my, well, you know, I know, probably know about four people that get a lot out of his book and everyone else would just be like, what the fuck are they talking about? It just quickly leaves you behind. But that's the point of the book, right? It's supposed to be an advanced text. Um, Scientific Principles of Strength Training, not a simple book to read, right? But it makes a lot of sense if you have the requisite knowledge. So this book is that requisite scientific knowledge that is demonstrated in Brad Schoenfeld's hypertrophy textbook, all of which is empirically confirmed, right? And it takes the one next leap above that and says, okay, now that we know all this stuff, where can we go with training and with programming? And those are all, to some extent, I always say leaps of faith. Uh, they are, to some extent, ex extrapolations. And we're totally cool with that, and we always label them as such. There is zero dogma in this book. Everything in this fucking book could be wrong. It is definitely our best guess. Um, as far as something that's uh, very tentative, we just don't discuss it or we mention it. So we'll say, well, you know, um, is it really more beneficial in a given circumstance to train five days a week versus four days a week? We honestly don't know. There's no theoretical reason to believe one way or the other, and there's certainly no data to believe one way or the other. So we just don't know, and you know, whichever one works for you, you should do, but be open to new ideas. So we'll say something like that. Um, there's a long discussion about, a uh, longer discussion about the damage, the relationship to damage and soreness, and we honestly say it is just very unclear if it's, uh, it's definitely a correlative relationship, and we understand the correlation quite well now, that there's a U-shaped curve, but is it causative to some extent to have damage, or is it prohibitive to some extent, or to all extents to have damage? Um, and it's just a cross-correlation there. Uh, we just don't know. Uh, we just don't know, and we say as much. Um, but the good news is, that doesn't really change recommendations much. And if something changes recommendations, and we don't know about it, then we say, you know, we, we can't actually make any finite recommendations, but here are three or four ideas that you should give some thought uh, and they will probably make some pretty decent recommendations for you. Wish we had five or six to close the loop, but we don't, right? And um, funny enough, your question, I can answer it even better than I did with the following. People used to, after we published, uh, myself, James, and Chad published Scientific Principles Strength Training in 2014, I think, 2014, 2015. The people were like, okay, this book is amazing. What am, Most people were like, this book sucks, right? But uh, um, for the few people that found it tolerable, uh, some of them asked, you know, what uh, when is the scientific principles of hypertrophy training coming? At the time, I, I don't want to say I surveyed the literature because I live in a permanent surveil of the literature. I resurveyed it for the 150th time in my own head and in the in the actual published works. And I my answer was for literally five years, we don't know, I don't know, I don't know enough. James Hoffman doesn't know enough. Jared Feather doesn't know enough to write a scientific principles of hypertrophy training book that would be in any way a holistic work. Uh, because like, for example, frequency, per session volume, volume landmarks. Five years ago, I, I coined, James and I coined the volume landmarks. So, so six years ago, right in the book would have been pure nonsense, right? Be like, how much should you train would have been a chapter that was straight up just non-existent or not addressed, right? Um, uh, frequency. Up until very recently, the frequency for hypertrophy training was fucking, who knew the fuck was going on? I sure as hell didn't. Uh, and, and a variety of other uh, subjects like that, where now we're getting finally some real solid ground what I mean by solid ground is most of the literature that's coming out now is reconfirming the older literature. Once you start to see that pattern, you, and, and it makes sense in a very good theoretical framework, which is what we're writing about in this book, man, you really start to get going about, okay, we're really starting to understand some stuff. Now we can write about it to at least give some good recommendations. I have no doubt in my mind that several years from now we'll be doing a rewrite, an update, an expanded edition of this book to clarify things and to probably remove things that were outright wrong. And uh, I'll be very apologetic about the things we got wrong, but not apologetic at front end, just apologetic on the back end that, oops, that sucked. Um, some people think that you should not sort of take educated guesses. If you don't take educated guesses, you're, you probably don't wake up and pee in, at night because you're not so sure, 100% sure that urine will come out of your dick and not your face. So you don't know where to point the shit, right? So it's all educated guesses. There's a spectrum of, of, of uh, degree of accuracy, and we're very upfront about that spectrum. So the book is for mature audiences. It's for people that understand scientific nuance. If you don't understand scientific nuance, I don't know. Go listen to Lyle McDonald or some shit. I'm just kidding. I'm not kidding at all. Fuck that guy. But, uh, <laughs> but I really uh, like but, that but because, note, that's the deal, yeah. because I asked that more from uh, I guess playing devil's advocate rather than you know, phrasing it from, uh, you know, my own concerns about your book not having, you know, references and being 100%, uh, you know, the truth. Because uh, I think in the evidence-based community, we've seen this trend for, 
you know, PubMed warriors to wait for science to give them a license to, to do something or to explore something. Yeah. What are um, they doing in the interim? Do they not yeah. train? Well, actually, I'll say that question for you. These people don't train. So, yeah. yes, that's correct. Yeah, and I think um, it's a necessary step in our understanding of any topic for people to extrapolate, make educated guesses, and to just fucking explore ideas and concepts and put them out there because you know I think the internet's been great in getting information uh, yeah, to people, but obviously the quality of information is uh, yeah, not uh, always equal on the internet. So I think to have you know, some experts putting together something that they feel is yeah, their best efforts at understanding and explaining how muscle grows and what we need to do training to you know, maximize that process um, will be a big step forward in uh, generating a lot more forethought discussion and uh, ideas surrounding hypertrophy training. That's yeah. only a good thing. And, and mind you, the vast majority of the book is stuff that's not really up for debate. I mean, it's up yeah. for debate in a technical sense, but it's not really mysterious stuff. Yeah. We're just arranging it in such a way that it's very cogent, mm -hmm. we think, and it's all in one place, and it all sort of unifies into a grand theory. And uh, it just it's for people to... People have seen various truths on the internet about how to train, but they maybe have not um, sort of uh, aggregated them into yeah. a structure that makes sense in their head. And they just always say, oh, your sets of 10 are good. Or, you know, that's half my Instagram questions. Or what do you think about, you know, slow eccentrics? Or but what about sets of 10? What about the Smith machine? What about this? What about that? It's like, well, if you understood the theoretical underpinnings of hypertrophy, which are not really very mysterious or up for debate, you'd be able to answer all these questions yourself and realize mm -hmm. most of them are just really very minor questions. But if you just have a whole bunch of ideas floating around, yeah, it gets shit gets fucking confusing. Yeah. It's like, Mike, do you stretch? It's like, yeah, I put fucking heavy weights on my back and I bend my knees. That is stretching. Here's me doing a full <laughs> range of motion squat, yeah. as full as it gets. That's stretching, brother. Now, Mike, thank you very much for your time. Guys, uh, be sure to follow Mike uh, and all of the RP team on Instagram. If you are from the UK, uh, be sure to go check out the RP and Revive Stronger seminar this May. Uh, Mike, May 12th, May 11th. May yeah. 11th and 12th. Mike, uh, Gabrielle Fundaro, and James, I believe, yep. uh, are all heading yep. over to uh, the UK to present uh, over a few days. Uh, and if you want to check out uh, Revive Stronger's website uh, for more details, but be sure to do so. I'll put a link in the description box uh, below. And then, guys, if you can't attend the seminar uh, in Melbourne in June, RP will also be traveling around Australia. I know they're going to Brisbane, uh, to Sydney, Perth. I think you're doing a yep. whole bunch of different seminars around Australia. Brisbane, Sydney, Perth, Melbourne. Yep. Yeah, yep. hopping around like kangaroos. Uh, so be sure to go uh, attend their seminars. I've been to uh, the RP seminar uh, exclusively at PTC in Melbourne, South Melbourne uh, last year, and it was absolutely phenomenal. The guys are a wealth of knowledge, as I'm sure you all know already, so make sure you get to one of those seminars. And if you want to see Mike along with a bunch of other people um, that you probably already know about uh, at the UEBC, tickets are available. Uh, selling out fast. I think it's less than two months now. So we're going to see you really shortly, Mike. I'm super excited. Yeah, it'll be good, man. And it'll be good to have you bulking. We can go get some Chinese food again and watch you absolutely demolish Fuck. kilos of chicken. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Easy, Mike. Guys, I'll speak to you next time. Thanks for tuning in. And Mike, always a pleasure and a privilege. We really appreciate always. your time. You bet. Take care. Thank you.